kids are dismissed. Find Molly in the back. While uh, they're heading out, I'll take this opportunity to share just a couple of quick things uh, with you. One is that um, we have some eggs that were donated to the church body. So on your way out, uh, there I think there were like 80 dozen eggs. Um, welcome to take uh, however many you want, can use. Um, don't get them until afterwards. I don't want any eggs being thrown at me while I'm preaching. Um, so, but uh, thank you to, to Amy Hess and for that donation. And, um, blessing to, to all uh, who could use them. And uh, secondly, I will be heading out tomorrow morning to uh, the Holy Land, so uh, New York City. And oh, the Holy Land, uh, Israel, uh, via New York City, which... That part I'm not necessarily looking forward to, um, but uh, I told the 8 o'clock crowd this, and I'll tell you, it, it's a way to kind of keep me accountable. Um, my plan is to take pictures, which I don't do much of, and post on Facebook, which I don't do much of, uh, every day uh, while I'm gone, just to kind of give you a little update on where I've been and, and what I'm seeing, and kind of bring you into the loop of... Uh, that experience, so uh, looking forward to that, uh, but pray for me um, as I travel and uh, especially come back um, so that I don't get stranded anywhere. Uh, the, the, the state of Israel is pretty restricted, and so there's a lot of COVID testing coming and going and, and all that, so uh, Lord willing, you know, all that will work out, and uh, I'll be back with you in a couple weeks, but uh, looking forward to that tomorrow. So uh, where we left Jesus last week in Nazareth was his hometown, uh, was uh, ready to pitch him off the side of a hill. And he, what did he do? Anybody remember? He just walked away. Um, and, and I believe that the reason why he allowed for that whole thing to even happen uh, was to give uh, a witness to those folks about his authority and his power and who he is. Uh, but at that point in the story, all we knew for sure was that Jesus had four disciples. Uh, he had uh, gone to Judea, the, uh, around the region of the Jordan River, and John the Baptist was baptizing, and John said, there is the Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. And Peter and Andrew, as well as Nathaniel and Philip, begin to follow him at that point. Um, and so from there, they go to Cana, and there's a wedding, and Jesus turns the water into wine, and they, after his first sign, put their faith in him. But we don't know of any other disciples uh, except for those four at that point. Now, here's all I'm really trying to get to at this point is that... Um, while the message of the gospel and the miracles are uh, the prominent feature of Jesus' ministry, uh, one of the distinguishing marks of what Jesus did was to uh, gather and train and call and equip uh, disciples. Okay? And then the distinguishing feature of Christianity to this day is that God uses, and this is his divine choice, and, and I don't 100% quite understand why God would choose it this way, but it was his divine choice um, to have you and me be his representatives on the earth uh, to continue to declare the truth of the gospel. And he could have done anything that he wanted, but he said, uh, what Christianity is, okay, is that you and I are, are not following a religion. I don't know how many of you realize that. We're not following a religion. We are following a person in discipleship. We are, as Christians, disciples of Jesus. And there are some things that we do religiously. Okay, We worship religiously. We, we read our Bibles religiously. We give religiously. We, you know... Uh, do lots of things, you know, in, and all that means is that we're 
trying to make a regular discipline or practice of some things. Um, but if that's what you're doing and thinking that's what Christianity is, then you've missed the point. Amen? Christianity is about following a person, Jesus Christ. And all the other things are simply to help strengthen us in that walk with him. Uh, and so uh, the amazing thing, the thing that I don't quite understand is that God would choose to use such weak and fundamentally flawed human beings, as we all are, to be his physical representation on the earth. But that's what we, we're here to do. Uh, not just to be saved, which is wonderful. I'm so happy to be saved, aren't you? To know that no matter what happens when I die, that I get to be with the Lord in heaven. That is, that is the best gift that I can possibly imagine having. Um, but that's not what I'm here to continue to, to do and be about. I'm, I'm here to proclaim Jesus Christ. That's, that's why we exist as, as human beings, as believers, is to help other people to know, to see, to validate, to confirm that Jesus is real. Okay, I'm already preaching. I haven't gotten to the Word yet, so let's, uh, let's uh, pick up Matthew 10. Matthew 10, verses 1 through 15, and let's stand as we read God's Word this morning. He called to him his twelve disciples, gave them authority over unclean spirits, to cast them out, to heal every disease, every affliction. The names of the twelve apostles, see he changes from disciples to apostles, that's intentional, are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out, instructing them, Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You received without paying, give without pay. Acquire no gold or silver or copper for your belts, no bag for your journey or two tunics or sandals or a staff for the laborer deserves his food whatever town or village you enter find out who is worthy in it stay there until you depart as you enter the house greet it and if the house is worthy let your peace come upon it but if it is not worthy let your peace return to you and if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town Truly I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. And Lord, we, uh, we live in a nation today that has begun to turn away from you in so many ways. And yet, Lord, we, uh, we see faith. We see worthy people, receptive people, Lord, who want to hear the truth, who want to know you. Everywhere we turn, such a strange battle that we're in. Lord, we are ambassadors for the kingdom. We see division, we see faith, we see anger, and Lord, we just pray that your Holy Spirit would give us the wisdom to know how to be your ambassadors, Lord, your missionaries, your disciples, uh, to our place, to our time, to our community, our workplaces, our schools, our homes, Lord, wherever we go, Father, we pray that we would represent Christ well. And, uh, Lord, that we would not fear what the world fears, Lord, but that we would live in awe of you in respect for you and respect for humanity, Lord, for the, the lives that we are coming into contact with, God, that you care enough for each and every one that you would be willing to die for them, that we might value them as much as you do and, and seek to live a life with as much character, 
faith and honor that the world would see Christ in us, Lord. It's such a strange thing that we are your representatives here on this earth, Lord, but it's what you called us to be, Lord. Help us to do it well. Do it for your glory and for the sake of this world, Lord, that needs you. And uh, God, in all these things, we pray you would be glorified and we would be blessed in it. In Jesus' name, amen. So, as we uh, see here a distinction between disciple and apostle, um, let me just back it up just, just for a moment. Uh, Jesus had many hundreds, if not potentially thousands of what we would call disciples. It just means that these people were coming around, interested, hearing, uh, responding to Jesus' ministry. Um, and, and so when we talk about the 12 disciples, um, when, as soon as we say 12, we know that we're talking specifically about the apostles. And we don't get too confused that these, this is the same group. There were many hundreds of disciples, but there were only 12 apostles. Uh, now, the, the stories that we saw and have seen already about their call is interesting because um, what happened initially was that Jesus was just beginning his ministry. He's coming to the public eye. John points and says, he must become greater, I must become less. He's the Lamb of God. He's going to take away the sin of the world. And initially, some of John's disciples begin to follow Jesus, but they follow, I'm not going to say at a distance, but they kind of follow part-time, okay? And then Jesus goes to Galilee. This is where they live. Here's an interesting little factoid, okay? And this will become important later if I remember to bring it back up. But... 11 of the 12 apostles were from Galilee. One was from Judea, or where Jerusalem is. Jerusalem is the religious center, right? Can you guess who was from Jerusalem? As far as we know, Judas is the only apostle that was from Jerusalem. The other 11 were from Galilee. Take that for what it might be worth. Uh, I think there's some important points that will be made about that. Jesus goes to Galilee, and the story that we know of calling um, Peter and, and uh, Andrew and James and John into a full-time ministry or full-time uh, discipleship is, uh, we can find it in Luke chapter uh, 5, and uh, the, uh, the other Gospels talk about it. Uh, Matthew and Mark also talk about it. John doesn't really get, get into any detail about it, um, but uh, Luke does. And what he says is interesting because his Gospel is the only one that actually goes into the detail of what actually happened with the miracle. The other ones just say Jesus was walking along and said, hey, come follow me. And uh, Luke actually says there's actually a lot more to the story, and here's, here's what it is. Uh, Jesus was teaching in Luke chapter 5. He was, he was uh, on one occasion while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God. Uh, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. Now Luke calls the, the Sea of Galilee the lake of Gennesaret. Um, and he saw two boats uh, by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. That's Peter and Andrew. Okay, Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out uh, a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. So he's got a couple good things happening here. He he's, can get away from the crowd and um, audibly or, or there's a, a, a power that kind of begins to happen that the, the, the uh, sea behind you is, uh, acts as some kind of a, a volume increasing um, attribute. I don't, I don't know how that works, but it does work. I've been there and I've seen it and heard it in action. And so he's able to speak to this large crowd on the shore while he is in the boat. Um, and it says this, when he had finished speaking, see, what's interesting, we don't know what he said. He did, the sermon is lost here. We don't have any of the, the details of what he actually said. But when he finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. See, their normal practice is to, to fish at night. Not only is it cooler, 
Uh, but it also, that's when the fish are active. They, they wouldn't have turned around and went fishing that morning. Um, and when the, they had done this, um, so he says, but at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat, James and John, to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. Okay, so we're talking about a lot of fish. <laughs> um, this is remarkable and, and to the extent that it says when uh, Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, depart from me for I am a sinful man, O Lord. He knows that this is not just a miracle, but that the one who performed it is the Son of God. He, and this is something that begins to become more and more clear to him over time, but he, he initially understands there's something remarkable about Jesus. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish they, were ha they had taken, and also uh, were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you will be catching men. Um, and when they had brought their boats to the land, they left everything and followed him. Now, what's happening here is that when you read through the Gospels, here's what you need to understand about every miracle Jesus ever performed. Every single miracle and, and act of healing and uh, miraculous reproducing of food or this miraculous catch, all of it validates and confirms that Jesus is the Messiah. Okay? That's what all of them are about. This one specifically is about that, first of all, but secondly, it's about Jesus confirming to the disciples the value of what it is that they are about to do, okay? They are going to enter into something that is very purposeful, that their job is no longer going to be just to catch fish, which, uh, how many of you like fishing? Okay, some, some people like fishing. Is it enjoyable? Or else you wouldn't do it. Right? I mean, I don't think any of us are fishing for uh, our daily food. Okay? So they're, they're enjoying this uh, job that they have. It's, you know, partly um, their livelihood and partly something that I think for them was something they found some value in. There's some purpose in it. Nothing wrong with fishing. But Jesus is going to compare uh, the value of a fish with the value of a human life. Which one's more important? <laughs> fish. The, uh, the reality is that they knew and understood that the, the value of a human life was so precious in God's eyes that if they could be involved in catching a person, catching, helping somebody to know salvation and eternal life, then they'd made a difference eternally. Now, Catching men is probably not as enjoyable as catching fish. Because <laughs> uh, a fish, once you catch it, you can just clean it and sell it and eat it. Uh, but a man, you've got to keep dealing with. Keep struggling with. Keep helping. Keep uh, arguing with. If they're going to be involved in something that is so fundamentally important to the future of the world and the future of God's kingdom... This is what God was calling them to. And so he needed to make sure that they understood that it was going to be God's power at work, but that he's calling them into a lifelong, full-time, purposeful mission to rescue people from damnation. And let's just pause for a second and understand that that was their call, and it is our call too. Okay? You're not just invited to enjoy eternal life. You are invited to enjoy eternal life. Thank the Lord that we all have the opportunity to re receive Jesus and know that we're going to go to heaven, okay? But that's not what you are called to. You are called to be an ambassador for Jesus to the world. So how you live your life and the things that come out of your mouth and the activities that you involve yourself in and the things that you refuse to do and how you, your character is displayed at work or school or in your home or wherever you go, always, okay, no, it doesn't matter if, if you're going to intentionally say, okay, I'm going to go be a witness, you're always a witness. You're, you're always on display for Jesus. And I don't know if you're like me, but um, I, I don't always 
uh, remember how important it is that I'm, I'm going to do that well, that I need to do that well. And I need to not, it's not that I need to be perfect, but I al- always need to fundamentally understand why I exist, that wherever I am and whoever I am with, that I am, I cannot help it, I am an ambassador for Jesus. It's not something I get to do when I feel like it. Or just on Sunday mornings when uh, I'm on the job, you know. And, and I've been asked this so many times. It's it's like it just becomes kind of the normal thing, I, you know. When I've been at uh, family camp with some church folks, and and uh, people ask, it doesn't matter. People from the church, people, other people in ministry, other people that I know, family members. Isn't it hard to go do that kind of stuff when you got church people around? Because you have to be on. And, I mean, and I'm just going to tell you, this is just my personal opinion, okay? I don't ever get to be off. It doesn't matter who I'm with. I, if I'm a, an ambassador for Christ, I'm always an ambassador for Christ. I'm never going to not be. It doesn't matter if I'm with church people who can, you know, pay my bills or not. It, it's, this is the life. It's the... It's the authentic, consistent life that, that we live as Christians. I'm not saying I do it perfectly. I'm just saying that I, I don't ever distinguish between being on or being off. And I don't know that any Christian should. But that's just my opinion. Okay, um, I know people seem to distinguish between when they have to be on and when they can get to be off. I don't think we get that choice. So... Anyway, he uh, calls those four specifically. Uh, we already know that there were two others that he had called earlier, okay, Nathaniel and Philip. So they're included in this mix somewhere. Then we have one other specific call, um, that, and it's the only other one that we have. So we have six that we know of at this point, and now we have one more, and it is the call of Matthew. And uh, in Matthew chapter 9, and all three of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all record Matthew's call. But Matthew 9, 9 says, as Jesus passed on from there, wherever he was, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at a tax booth, and he said to him, follow me, and he rose and he followed him. Uh, so Matthew becomes the seventh specifically, uh, uniquely called disciple. The other five, we don't know for sure. Maybe they had a specific call. Jesus approached them individually and said, follow me. We don't know. It doesn't record that in scripture. Maybe they were just uh, people who volunteered. Okay? They were just following Jesus and, and they decided that they you know, wanted to be full time. And he said, okay, I'm going to make you my designated apostles. Uh, we don't know for sure, but we do know about these specific ones. And I think that we know about these specific ones for a very particular reason. One, they were common. Okay, these were normal, ordinary folks. These were not scholars. These were not the priests. These were not the, the uh, wealthy. These were not people who, uh, who had major influence. These were just normal, working folks. And that's, in one sense, kind of important. Because what the gospel is, is this leveling out of the playing field for, for anyone who would receive Jesus. This is why, and, and before I go too far with that, I need to highlight something else about Matthew, okay? Uh, Matthew's not actually very common or normal or, or ordinary because Matthew is a vile, wicked, evil, detestable, hated tax collector, okay? And now, I've said this before, and I've gotten some pushback, like, why do you hate tax collectors? Like, why do you hate the IRS and you hate people who do taxes? And, uh, like, you know, Lisa, she's, how many thousands of tax returns is she doing? How evil does that make her? (laughs) So, listen, everybody hates paying taxes. Can I get an amen? (laughs) Okay. That's not the issue. That is not what's going on in the New Testament. In the New Testament, Matthew and all tax collectors were seen as traitors to the Jewish people, to Israel, because they were working for the enemy. They were working for the Roman government 
against the Jewish people. So whenever you see in the New Testament uh, the term tax collector, inevitably, almost every single time, it's going to be in reference to that they were wicked sinners, okay? And in fact, in Matthew 21, in verse, uh, what, 30, 31, truly I say to you, Jesus is talking here, truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you, talking to the religious people. So he's connecting prostitution with tax collecting and saying even the, the most significantly wicked, evil, rebellious people in, in your consciousness, okay, that you can imagine, they're receiving Jesus Christ, they're accepting the gospel, they're, they're moving into the kingdom ahead of, ahead of the religious. Now, what is happening here when he calls Matthew is that, again, he is displaying in very um, specific and intentional ways that the gospel is for anyone who would put their trust in Jesus Christ has nothing to do with skin color, with uh, economic uh, means, has nothing to do with your race, it has nothing to do with uh, your pedigree, your education, has nothing to do with your family life, has nothing to do with anything other than every single human being on the planet who will trust in Jesus Christ can have an equal footing at the cross. Amen? Listen. We talk about race, and, and maybe I don't have any right to say this because I'm a white man. But the Bible tells us that there is one race. It is the human race. It's not different race. It's, it's different s skin colors and different shapes of the eye and, and different hair textures. But it's one race. And we, and I, whenever I hear somebody say something about race, I don't necessarily every time jump on that. But I am kind of annoying about this one race. Because the gospel did something that we don't always understand where this came from. We understand in this country that people are equal, that they're created equal, that we have an inalienable right to these freedoms that we enjoy. Where did that come from? Do you understand that that was a biblical, and not just a biblical, but especially a New Testament, Christ-oriented understanding of the human being? That's where that came from. That in the New Testament, we were told that we had neither Jew nor Greek nor, nor barbarian or Scythian or slave or free or male or female. Like, like the human race has always had a sinful inclination to oppress and to um, control and to divide based on differences. That's a sinful nature characteristic. The new nature in Christ means that we are gathered into a family not based on any of those things, but only based on a relationship to Jesus. We, th we think that the whole world should understand that we're all equal. We do believe that. But the reason why the world doesn't know or understand that is because the world doesn't know and understand Jesus. And we need to remember where our understanding of these things comes from comes from the gospel. So here's the other thing, okay, and I'm just going to, I know this horse is dead, I'll just beat it just a little bit longer, but the thing with that equality, I get, I mean, I have a lot of pet peeves, I won't talk about all of them, but there's one other one. God doesn't call the equipped, he equips the call. You ever heard that before? It's not true. Okay, He calls whoever he wants, and he'll equip them. But Paul was called. Would you agree? The Apostle Paul was called specifically. Paul was very, very equipped. He was, he was a genius. He was trained. He was educated. He was high-ranking in the religious world. Okay? He had everything going for him. God called him. When we say it's equal, we, sometimes we almost um, are down on people who are wealthy 
or people who are educated or people who are, you know, have standing or, or what? And listen, when it's equal, it's equal for everybody, including those who are, you know, on a socially different scale than, than the common person. It's equal. He calls Matthew, who probably is wealthy. He's a tax collector. And what that meant in that day was that, I mean, hopefully Matthew was doing everything above board and was very honest and didn't get into, you know, taking more than he needed to. But more than likely, he made a lot of money doing what he was doing. So he can call whoever he wants. And that's kind of the point is that he's calling everyone. These 12 he designated as apostles. Um, okay. Enough? <laughs> you don't know where we're going, so let's go, uh, let's go on here. The 12 apostles uh, are outlined in Matthew 10, 1 through uh, 4, and then they're given a, an immediate mission trip. Okay, so Jesus says... You will be, an apostle means somebody who is sent out with a commission or sent out as a representative or as an ambassador. So what he does initially is as he calls these 12, the Bible says that he prayed all night and then he confirmed with God, okay, his father, who the 12 should be, who the 12 that were going to be designated as apostles would be. And then he sent them out. He gave them instructions. And so in the, the next 10 verses, he's giving them instructions about a mission trip that they're about to go on. Okay, this is their short-term mission. Jesus apparently does not go with them. He sends them out probably two by two. That's why they're listed in twos, if you read this. Uh, Simon and Andrew, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew. Because it says that because they're sent out. These two will go here, these two go here, these two go here. So six groups of two, and they've been given a particular mission. Jesus is staying back, letting them do their thing. He gives them authority and power. He says, go nowhere among the Gentiles, enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of, of the house of Israel. Now, I'm going to tell you that even just saying that, it seems like that's almost a contradiction of what I just said about the, the gospel being for everyone. Does that seem like a little bit of a contradiction? Okay, and here's what's going on. Um, the gospel is for everyone, and it will be for everyone, but first of all, it has to be given to and offered to the Jewish people. And it's still offered to the Jewish people, amen? It's not like they're excluded. They, they're still included. Um, but why he sends them out to the Jewish people initially is because God has made irrevocable, unconditional promises to the Jewish people. Irrevocable, unconditional Okay? permanent, everlasting uh, covenant that he established with the Jewish people. It never has ended, never has stopped, and never will. And you, all you have to do is you've got to go back to Genesis chapter 15, and what you'll see is God's covenant with Abraham, who is the father of faith, and he's the father of the Jewish people, father of the, the Israelite nation, that God enters into a covenant with Abraham by himself, apart from anything that Abraham does. Okay. He uh, has a sacrifice, cuts animals in two big pieces and separates them. Okay. Sounds really awesome. Okay. And then what he does is instead of Abraham walking with God through between the pieces, which is the normal practice of a blood covenant, God himself alone goes through those, the, the, the two pieces, establishing that the covenant with Abraham is, what I said, irrevocable, right, permanent. And it is unconditional. It doesn't have anything to do with what Abraham will do or what anybody will do. God chose the Jewish nation. He chose the Jewish people. And he's going to establish them as a people, and he's going to give them a land, and he's going to give them uh, uh, benefits and, and blessings because of his promise to them. Now, let me pause here for a minute because there's something we need to understand. Two things. One is that uh, the, the, there's no Christianity without Judaism. We all understand that? Okay? We are always eternally indebted to the Jewish people. We're always connected to them. Uh, Romans says that we are like branches that have been grafted into a tree that, in the roots, and we're just, we're just unnatural 
but God has, in his grace, allowed us to be part of this tree that, that uh, is thriving and, and growing, okay? But they were the uh, people that God gave the word of God to. Almost all the scripture that we have was written by the Jewish people. God revealed himself to the Jewish people, and those people declared the word of God to us. Amen? God has brought his Messiah through the Jewish people. Jesus was and is a Jew. He's an Israelite. And I don't understand how any Christian could ever persecute the Jewish people. Like, that doesn't make any sense at all that there would be anti-Semitism among Christians. So he sends the, the word of God to them, um, and uh, we are indebted to them, and we are connected to them, and this is, this is permanent. Now, here's the other part of that. Okay, We have to understand this as Christians, because sometimes I, I get asked this, and, and a lot of Christians don't quite grasp the concept. Um, just because God has made promises to the Jewish people and he will fulfill those promises does not mean that every Jewish person is saved. Okay? Jesus clearly defined who comes to the Father, right? Only those who come through faith in him. Amen? That's non-negotiable. The Jewish people who are going to be in heaven are going to be the people who are faithful to believing in Jesus as their Messiah. Otherwise, there's multiple ways to be saved. And Jesus was not being accurate when he said that no one comes to the Father but by me. Okay, that, that statement would have to be thrown out. You'd have to go back through your New Testament and really hack it all up to try to fit the Jewish people into salvation apart from Jesus. But someday, large amounts, if not most, if not all, the Jewish people will receive Jesus as their Savior. All right. So he sends them out to the house of Israel that they might uh, have the first opportunity to believe in Jesus. He proclaim as you go, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So what that means is the Messiah is here, and the kingdom is, is going to be available um, you need to prepare yourself for it. That's not our message today, okay? Their message of the kingdom of God is, is near or at hand. Uh, that was their message while Jesus was doing his ministry on the earth. Our message is Jesus is the Messiah, and life can be found in his name. That's our message. Um, but they were given the preparation for the people to be able to come into the kingdom. So he says, proclaim as you go, and the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick raise the dead, cleanse the lepers. So he gives them power and authority so that they can validate and confirm that their message is true. Power and authority, which this is one of the elements that I thought, you know what? I think Christians don't really probably understand this whole issue of power and authority. That the, the disciples, the apostles, they had power and authority. It was, whose power and authority was it? Anybody? Whose power and authority was it? Through Jesus. Okay, it was Jesus' authority. Jesus himself had the authority. He said, uh, I have all power and authority. Uh, it's been granted to me. I can lay my life down. I can pick it back up again. Um, so this distinction between what is God's or Jesus' it doesn't really matter. Uh, Jesus had the power and authority. It's his power. It's his authority. The disciples were included in it, or they were given access to it, or they were granted it for a time. Now, here's the deal. You and I have power and authority as well. Would you agree? Whose is it? Okay. Now, here's the thing. And, and every believer who trusts Jesus Christ and, and has the Holy Spirit needs to understand this. You do have power and authority. To what extent that power is able to do miracles, okay? I, I believe the Holy Spirit is still in operation today in full extent. He, he can do anything he wants. God didn't say, well, I'm not going to stop doing stuff. I don't remember him ever saying that, okay? Um, but I don't see a lot of miracles happening. doesn't mean they can't happen or won't happen. But the reality is that we don't see a lot of authority spiritual authority among Christians 
um, because we are missing one of the elements that is fundamentally important about it, which is that whose is it? It's his. We take that for granted. So what we're doing in our life is we're not experiencing in our Christian experience every day uh, the, the authority that God has granted because we're not staying close to the one who has the authority. We're over here living our lives however we want and thinking, God, why don't you do more? And then... <laughs> some of you might want to check, see if there's a fire down there. Um, but <laughs> they're having a good time. If I were at a different point in the message, I would have you all scream too. But <laughs> So here's what's happening though. It, this is really a serious issue. We are not spending the time with God in our fellowship, in our relationship with him to the extent that we need to to be able to have the peace and the joy and the confidence that should be readily ours all the time. And it's not a selfish, uh, arrogant confidence, okay? When you spend the time that you need to with God to attain to that closeness of fellowship so that his power is, is consistently at work in your life, it will cause you a tremendous amount of peace and humility, not arrogance and pride and, oh, I can do all this for God. It's really a matter of, man, God... Why are you willing to use me? But you get to that point of closeness with the Lord where his Holy Spirit and, and the fellowship of the Spirit in your life is so consistent. And here's the deal. A lot of people feel like, man, where's the power? All this Holy Spirit power I've always heard about people having and, and all this stuff that should be happening in Christians' lives. And uh, if a person were truly uh, filled with the Holy Spirit, shouldn't they be at least able to resist temptation? And yet, how many Christians are faltering and, and stumbling and sinning overtly, intentionally, and just plunging themselves into to wickedness constantly? Like, where's the Holy Spirit in that? Don't you have the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to say, no, that's not right? I have the knowledge of God's word. I, shouldn't I be able to say, you know what? That's not what God would want. I'm not going to do that. And yet we just throw ourselves into sin constantly. And then we're like, oh, well, God will forgive me. And what's happening, I believe, is that we are not spending time with the Lord to the degree, I'm not saying that you have to spend 15 hours a day on your knees in prayer. I'm just saying that most Christians are not spending 15 minutes a day in prayer or in God's Word. And just look back over your week. How much of your week did you spend in fellowship with God? Just think through that. Where's the power? It's because we're not in close fellowship with God. You start spending time with the Lord, you're going to start sensing His direction, his conviction, his leading, his truth, you're going to start to understand like, oh, I need to start doing some things differently. And the only sense I can make of it is that a lot of Christian people who are called Christians and who are saved, they've taken at least the step of belief of I believe in Jesus. They're just not in fellowship with God. And I think it's really a shame. And I'm guilty, okay? I'm not saying, oh, I'm over here. I've spent all... I try to spend time with the Lord. Do you, does your mind work like mine? I'm sure it doesn't. But <laughs> you're praying, praying along, and you just kind of start getting distracted, thinking... And then it's like some wicked thought will come into your brain. You're like, oh, God, I'm so sorry. Or you're like... Uh, I got to start doing this, and I got all these things happening today, and oh, I got to make sure I get on my to-do list. And you just start getting distracted by all that stuff. And I'm telling you, you got to figure out a way to stay in that prayer time in a way that, that it can be an actual fellowship with God. Whatever you need to do, do it. And, and you probably already know what it is. Like, you've had those times, and you know, like, when you're driving, yeah, that's... I'm able to really pray. Or when I'm walking or when I'm alone in, 
it, you know, whatever it might be. I got this place in this time when it's dark or when I, you, you know what it is. And the, the problem is you're just not taking the time to do it. All right. So power and authority, but acquire no gold, silver, copper, copper for your belts, uh, no bag, staff, and all this stuff. What's happening here? A couple things real quick. Uh, one is that this is not to be a fundraising um, trip, okay? They're not supposed to be out there trying to collect money. And they also need to trust the Lord that he will take care of them. Now, later, when he's about to die, he tells them, before I told you, don't take an extra you know, pair of sandals and all this stuff. Now, when you go, not only take an extra pair of sandals, but grab a sword as well. And here's the reason why. There's a difference here. And this time, they're just getting the word out and they're just spreading the gospel, the truth of Jesus. But as they continue on in ministry, what's going to happen is the further they go, the more opposition that they're going to encounter. And it is okay to not allow yourself to be brutally beat up. Okay, I'm not saying you uh, harm people, but you may need to just leave an area that is not willing to accept you. And this is what he's telling them about the peace. He says that uh, when you go into a house that is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it's not worthy, let your peace return to you. All that language is a little bit confusing to us. But what's happening is that some people are receptive. And this is the nature of the gospel. Some people are receptive. Some people are antagonistic. You'll always have that. You go and you share the gospel and you speak the truth of, of Christ. And it's not you who saves people. You know that? I, I would love to try to convince people that they need Jesus and that he's the, the savior of the world, that the word of God is true. I, I don't have any problem trying to convince people, but I can't. You're accepting of what I'm saying because not only is it the word of God, but because you're already in agreement with it. And if you're not in agreement with it, right now sitting in your chair, you're just like, I don't believe the word this guy's saying. And there's nothing I can do to convince you about that. I pray for you love you, serve you, continue to proclaim the gospel to you, but I'm not going to waste time trying to convince somebody who's adamantly opposed to the gospel. I just keep praying, keep loving, keep proclaiming, and then move on to a person who's actually willing to accept. Because if you waste too much time on the person who is opposed, you're going to miss the opportunity to share with the person who's ready. And that's what he's saying. You can't get stuck. Here's how we get stuck. I'm so far over time, I'm sorry. <laughs> but here's, I got to tell you this. What happens is those who are stuck trying to convert somebody who is opposed to the gospel, they are losing their peace over it. They they're, have no peace. And they have no peace for themselves. And they have no peace because of their purpose. And they have all this this anxiety and then fear and worry about this person that they cannot make except Jesus. But that's where all their energy is going and they are in torment personally, emotionally, mentally until something changes and it's not up to them for something to change. You do your part. You give the rest to God and then you, can, you keep moving and you let your peace return to you. Because the, the fundamental characteristic of a believer should be peace. I, I know why I'm here. I know why I exist. I know that, that God is, is in control. I know that he's going to do what he's going to do, and I've got to do what I'm going to do. And I know where, what eternity leads to, and the rewards that are coming are mine, and the judgment that are, are coming are, are in God's hands. And I don't have to worry about that stuff. I just need to be faithful in doing what God's called me to do. And he's called me to be a representative for him in the world. Amen? And when somebody does accept Jesus, man, we rejoice. If somebody won't receive him, we've done what we can. God offered the invitation. We proclaimed it. They rejected it. That's, it's up to them. And I wish I could change that. How many of you wish you, you could change that for somebody? How many of you are not at peace because you, you're so overwhelmed with the anxiety for somebody? You've got to give that to the Lord. 
because it's not doing you any good to be in turmoil. You just, it's okay to have a burden. It's not okay to be overwhelmed with it. So you continue to proclaim and let God do what he's going to do. Well, the rest of the chapter is about the truth of what the gospel is going to be doing throughout history. It's going to be opposed. There's going to be persecution. We don't fear it. There will be a fundamental characteristic of believers, which is that my identity is in Christ, which means that I identify most with those who are also in Christ, even if those people are not my immediate family. Some of my immediate family may not know Christ. My allegiance is with Jesus. We're just going to continue to offer the greatest gift the world has ever known. Amen. Father, we love you. God, we praise you that you've given us the power and the message and the purpose, Lord. You've, you've called us into a mission, Lord, that <laughs> is amazing. It's hard. Sometimes it's overwhelming and frustrating. But it, it's the greatest mission this world has ever known. To be able to rescue people for all eternity, to offer them uh, a new body, permanent, uh, glorious body, uh, freedom from any emotional turmoil for all eternity, uh, riches beyond measure forever, joy that uh, will be uh, beyond anything this world has ever offered, have purpose to know that uh, we exist for a reason. In the world, all it offers is some really awful just terrible manufactured uh, uh, things that aren't even close to the joy that we have. Temporary pleasures and momentary um, distractions. Why they're so appealing, God, I, I don't know. But I thank you that you have presented to us greater things. And uh, you offer it to us free of charge, Lord. And you paid for it. Lord, help us to grab a hold of the promises, grab a hold of the hope and the new life that we have in Christ. And God, we'll just proclaim it, seek to live it for your glory the best we can. Lord, we pray that you would take that weak proclamation, Lord, and just do a miracle. Save a life, Lord. Draw people to yourself, God, and we will give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Just want to invite you this morning. There's one question that uh, is on my mind that I want to just pose to you. Um, we are representatives of Christ in the world. Amen. How are we doing? Just... Every, everybody who, who here who is a believer, just how am I doing? Just ask that question to yourself. Do people know? Do they know? And would they be able to say, that person represents Christ and they do it well? We should all be able to say amen and yes to that. And if we, we don't, then we need to say, God, forgive me and help me. And I want to grow in that. Amen? Let's stand and sing.